If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, for the first 29 minutes, we have a nice time uh, bullshitting like we normally do. We talked about... My favorite part. One of the greatest movies of all time, The NeverEnding Story. Great movie. Uh, and how we show yeah. our kids these old movies and how they usually crap on them. Yeah. Uh, Adam talks about is uh, a great uh, documentary series on HBO called The Defiant Ones. He kind of identifies with it because of the title. Hmm. He's a defiant one himself. Uh, we also talk about being part of the 1% and teaching the value of money to our kids and kids and swearing. Uh, we we think our kids might be starting to say bad words. And then we talk about the first time oh, shit. we got caught saying bad words. Now we say them all the fucking time on Mind Pump. <laughs> we do. Then we get into the questions. The first question was, what is the difference between conventional and sumo deadlifts? Are they the same? Are they interchangeable? Or are they two separate exercises? Find out in this mm. episode. Then we talk about cortisol, the evil hormone that's also necessary for health. Uh, how to keep it at healthy levels. Um, Adam mentions that he's been using the green juice from Organifi that contains some adaptogenic herbs like ashwagandha, which has been shown to balance out cortisol levels in people who are uh, in high stress and how he's noticing uh, better energy. By the way, you can get Organifi if you go to OrganifiShop.com. That's Organ Organifi spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I shop s-h-o-p dot com enter the code mind pump for a discount then the next question is how effective are nootropics for treating someone with adhd i forgot what i was going to say and then the next question is uh does the way you cook your food matter uh like boiling baking steaming barbecuing or raw does it make a big difference should you be uh, concerned with how you prepare your food also, if you're listening to this episode on the day it drops, you lucky son of a bitch. Our promotion is going on still, but it ends tonight at midnight. That's uh, probably you one of our get on that shit. Uh, one of our more popular well, promotions. Well, the Facebook program or the Facebook forum is going up after today. It's going up in price, period, for everybody. Yeah. But if you enroll, Sayonara. enroll in any maps program or any bundle in, tonight up until midnight, you get access to our forum on Facebook for free. There's over about 2,000 members on there, lots of fitness professionals, uh, doctors. Uh, we are on there, of course, me, Adam, and Justin. Uh, lots of funny memes. It's basically like Mind Pump, but in a forum. Yeah. It's a great uh, resource. But you, And again, you get it for free for enrolling in a Some people hook bundles. up. You know, no big deal. By the way, one of our more popular bundles recently uh, has been our Build Your Butt bundle, which is pretty cool. That combines MAPS uh, aesthetic and MAPS Anabolic with a modification that helps you activate your glutes so that when you do train your glutes really hard, your butt becomes like Adam's, round juicy. and juicy. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in any of this uh, of these programs and you want to get the promotion, here's what you do, okay? Turn off this uh, podcast. Go on your browser. Type in uh, Mind but Pump Media. MindPumpMedia.com. You know I mean? Uh, and enroll. Again, I was distracted there. Mindpumpmedia.com. Enroll for the discount until mon uh, until midnight. I'm going to interject. Thank you. Yeah. Real quick, let's see who guesses first, Adam or Justin, this song. Whoever wins gets lunch. Uh, ready? You ready, Adam? Mm-hmm. Hold on. You already feel it, Justin. I can tell. Never ending story. God damn it! Yes, he's so good. Never ending story. That's the never ending story. Oh never my. ending story. Oh my god! Dude. Uh, I would have never. I would have never got that. Did you watch that movie? I did. Like when I was fucking seven. What? Wow. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember it. God, yeah, that song was like stuck in everybody's I definitely head. Don't, yeah, I definitely don't remember the song. That's crazy. <laughs> See? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know the words. You know what I'm realizing that. about you, Justin? Uh, Me and you have a lot in common. I know. We remember random shit. Yeah, it's like totally random. Yeah, totally except random. you also remember fucking like 
super like specific no, it's not. articles. It's still and random. That's, that's different. I just it just so happened to like get a podcast yeah. and now I can make use of it. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. But before that, I didn't. It was fucking way. It was good in conversation. I'm still trying to find my superpower. Yeah, it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jingles. Okay. Jingles. Yeah. See, you know, this is why I always compare myself to Joey. You know, from uh, Full House. Oh uh, yeah. Because he was like the jingle guy. I swear to God, I missed my calling. Like I could come up with like stupid ass songs and sell shit. Yeah. Like, you kind of have so, you. You kind of have similar mannerisms as him too. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have some more memories. Yeah, for I sure. Uh, I feel like I'm. I uh, just don't. I'm not that dorky. You know what I mean? Have you? Have you? <laughs> Maybe. Have you had a chance to show your kids uh, Never Ending Story? Not yet. No. Will they watch old shit? Like I don't that? know. I I they like they might lot, be bored. No, 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 yeah. no, no. I'll tell you why it's good. Yeah. Because when you watch old movies where they try to do. Um, like special effects, like uh, a flying dog who just doesn't. Like well, it. here's the thing: because they use, yeah, yeah, because they used a lot of uh, like puppet type stuff. Because it's kind of like um, the black. Uh, what's that? What's that one movie? Black, black Crystal. Mirror? Oh yeah, Black Dark, Crystal. Dark Crystal. Dark Crystal. Sorry, Labyrinth. They've got the puppets and shit, and yeah. uh, like my kids aren't used to seeing that. I know. Because Jim Henson. Yeah, that was like everywhere yeah, in so, our era, and then now it's like you barely see. Yeah. So I showed my daughter, and she's just like, "Oh my god, this is so awesome!" Plus, it's a good story. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, she actually liked it because of that. See, mo- I would different. think most kids don't like it because they think it looks no, graphically weak. It looks gr- weak <laughs> when you try and show them an old movie that tries to use like old CGI or stuff like that, then my yeah. kids are like, this looks stupid. Well, that's what's cool because like, um, yeah, my oldest, he loves like the old Star Wars. He doesn't like, he doesn't like any of the new stuff that has CGI in it, like any of it. He loves wow. like old Stormtrooper helmets and all that kind of stuff because it's like, it looks more real, you know? Oh, that's like, funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, the old ones were de- the definitely the three that came out after the original three were were caca. Were shit. Yeah, yeah. Were but the oh, last shit. the last couple, I thought they did really good job. I of liked being, it a being, lot. Yeah. Being true to the graphics and what it well, looked especially like. Rogue One, it it really like kind of brought back a lot of that like dirtiness and that grunge and like you know run down uh, uniforms and shit. So I think that's the, a lot of people appreciated that. You mm-hmm. know, did you guys finish watching all the four Defiant ones? I haven't. I haven't. Got to watch. Are they really good? I haven't even watched one yet. I keep forgetting. Oh, shit. How are you forgetting to watch this? I'm going to write that down right now. so motivating, dude. God. To see what this these guys have built, bro, and a lot I didn't realize uh, how much Jimmy Iveen, right? Iveen or Ivy? I can't forget how you pronounce. Oh, from name. Apple, the designer. Well, yeah, but he's connected to. Originally, he was the you know uh, producer for. I mean, he started with Bruce Springsteen and and all those guys. Oh, that's this guy's name. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, he was in the first well, one. Too, yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So he's in all of them because it's really it's kind of he's a smart dude, dude. His. I didn't realize how many people were connected to him and how many of these crazy collaborations and music that we've seen mm-hmm. were because of him. Hmm. Like he's that's he is the the out of anybody in the in the industry, I don't think anybody has put more people together that have turned into huge like hits. And the, I mean it started with the acquisition of uh Interscope uh records, but which was you know, Death Row was a part of that. And mm-hmm. like their whole image was pushing back. And I, I identify so much with it because this was when I was a kid. Listen, I was really into music at this time. So I listened to like all, I didn't realize that they were, they owned all this. Uh, you know, they had Marilyn Manson, they had Death Row, Nine Inch Nails, Nine Nails yeah. uh, uh, Gwen Stefani. Like they did no doubt, like they did all the people that were edgy that mm. nobody wanted to touch. And they like prided themselves on finding these like, people that were pushing the boundaries. Yeah, because I remember when No mm-hmm. Doubt music, when that was like hard to categorize, like what kind of music was yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. And that's what he, he searched for these artists that was were- Was Red Hot Chili Peppers on that label? No. no. See, that, Red Hot Chili Peppers were some of the people that uh, were another one of those bands that we talked about that tried to stay garage as long as they could. Oh, and, right, Yeah, right. I don't remember the label that they were with, if they ever even signed with a major label or not. I yeah. can't think of the off the top of my head. Yeah, there but, was a lot of good artists on Interscope. I remember that. That was like oh, a big And he's responsible label, for yeah. literally all of it. And then Dre's story too and how he when he left Death Row and then went over and d- created his own label Aftermath and why he did that. Like I remember I was so much into music at that time and so and it really filled the holes and gaps of things that I wasn't certain about. I was like, "Oh, that's why that happened." Or, "Oh, hmm. I always wondered why he left during that time because it was such the it was, they were killing it and this and so pretty cool to watch, you know, his his story. They, they it was it's very well written and 
because I own all the documentaries on all those guys. And I've seen a ton of stuff on Tupac and, and Biggie and all them. And they really got dug into the behind the scenes and the business side of it, which I really enjoyed. Very little mm-hmm. of the hype and drama and the bullshit that the media fed you with, mm-hmm. which was to promote all this stuff and to make really about all the guys that were making millions of dollars and the shit that they were going through while all this went down. And, yeah. you know, pretty fucking great. Well done, man. It was HBO did that. I think that series, uh, the Defiant one. So if you haven't watched that yet, check that out. I'm I think that was that. probably one of the better series that I've watched in a while. More money, more problems. You know what they say? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true. I, that's, I know. Yeah. I hate at, when people- At all. Yeah, yeah. when they yeah. say that. I got more problems now. Well, good for you. Yeah, those are good problems to have. And there's, you know uh, there's some truth to that, like right? You, you make your problems when you got that. Well, though. I think that's different. With more money, you know what? I was, I was actually looking at these random stats. Like, do you, do, do you know person. how many companies actually make it to a hundred million dollars, and how many people actually make a million dollars, like become millionaires? Like the percentage is, you know, the percentage of millionaires is like one point five percent. You know, that's how rare it is. Mm. Really? And yeah. Now, that is people that actually make a million plus dollars per year. Not not who have accumulated a million yes, dollars. Yes, right. Because there's uh, a much, much, much larger. There is a much that's larger. A n- there's a much larger number of people that have assets as far as homes and things like that that are valued. So they're just that. liquid cash. Like yeah. This is their... People that are millionaires, right? Okay. If you're a millionaire and you could go, you know, pull a million dollars out of an account. Well, now you don't have to be able to pull a million dollars out. You make a million dollars in revenue every year or more. Mm-hmm. It's only one point five percent. There's not a there's not a lot of people that actually make that. And we we talk about you know how uh, many people in the U.S. Doug, you said what was the number? Three hundred fifteen million. Three hundred fifteen million. So how many millionaires is that then? There are no or people making. Yeah, there's a, there, you got to look at the to separate those because there's there's a lot more people that are worth a million dollars because you've inherited yeah. it or you know so you so you come from a rich family or it's people you, who are earning earned, yes yeah, people who are making a million or a more million. per year yes so that makes that's about uh, 4.7 that that's 4.7 million people in America who make a million dollars per year yeah which is not yeah. much considering there's 300 million no you're the people. part of the one percenters man if you get into that into that range and just i think a lot of people put the facade on like they are and act yeah there's act, a lot of yeah fakers there's sure. a, t- a ton of people that act the big game and act like there's a, a lot of money but you know and you and we all know right being in the position we are building what we're building right now i think a lot of people think that you know the the mind pump. There's all the success, and yes, we've had a ton of success. But the revenue isn't there for us because we have to pay well, employees. Invest. And yeah, you gotta you gotta. If you're really gonna build a company that makes a hundred million dollars a year, mm-hmm. uh, you know it's gonna be quite some time before you're ever even making that kind of money because you've got to continue to dump it back into the business and reinvest in people. I and, and, I mean to run a company that makes. 50 to 100 million dollars a year you don't you can't do that with five people like Mm-mm. unless you're the anomaly right somebody who hit something just crazy and even those people that that company doesn't sustain itself unless you've got a staff to continue to to build and reinvent and you know i think the a lot of the the sh- i was watching and then I, of course that's just how my mind goes i get down the rabbit hole of starting to google and search and like yeah. <laughs> dive into more stuff and i'm like god damn i can't believe how few of people actually Break that that milestone of making that kind of money. What are you pulling up right now, Doug? What is that? Some stats here. It's actually lower than that. Is it, huh? That's lower. So what is the number there? It's a uh, two hundred thirty-six thousand make a million in a year out of so, that uh, out of three hundred and actually twenty-three million people in the United States. Wow. Oh, that's small. That's not much at all. No, very low. Wow. I would not be in the top one percent. You need to make three hundred eighty thousand dollars a year. That's the one percent, huh? Well, well that's on the whole think, U.S. I'd like to see what the one percent. These numbers, I think, are from like two thousand nine, so they're a bit old. Hmm. It still Great. gives you a good. Well, think about it this way: if you're hmm. making a million dollars a year in income. You're probably you're you've got some some, some great investments. Yeah. To make that much, right? I mean, you've got some incredible investments. Well, you don't even need a million in certain parts of the country to, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, having a million in assets is not that rare around here, mm-hmm. around the no, Bay Area. Because that's why you, if the, you bought a house, 15, that's why I took that out of there because it's a huge difference, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of people, which I think, and I'm not interested in those people. I'm not interested, not to take anything from someone like that. Like, I'm not interested in somebody who. You know, your you your dad made a hundred million dollars and set you up with <laughs> three houses, and yeah. you have a business. You don't count. You yeah. don't. Sorry. Like I, I'm interested in people that have have created this wealth for themselves, and not a lot of people. You could spend your entire lifetime, you know, trying to reach that that status of of income. Um, and I think, 
with uh, with social media and with everything that we have out there that you have so many fakers out there that put on this you know facade or they the, the little bit of money they do make they put it into these these things that make it look like they have way more money than what they really mm-hmm. have and it, in reality very very few make it to that and what it takes to to reach that point is it's ridiculous man mm-hmm. and it's and I, I always tease Katrina all the time because I know she gives me a hard time sometimes when I, I can be very distracted, you know, at home and stuff because I'm I'm always thinking on things that need to be done or what we're working on currently or, you know, what what how we're going to transition or move in two or three years because that's another thing too is, you know, a business is never, is never stagnant. There's no such thing as like, oh, I'm cruising along. You're either dying or you're growing at mm. all times. And so the hardest thing I think for people that are, they're chasing that, they get caught up in this like, you know, oh, we're doing well, or things are going well, or it's like, no, like, it, it, are we growing? Well, no, if the, if the numbers aren't reflecting us growing, then technically we are dying. And uh, people have a hard time it, accepting that. And then knowing how to reinvent yourself to constantly do it. I'm so fascinated in businesses and people and that, like going back to the defiant ones, you know, you watch someone over 10, 20, 30 years, you got to continually be making these these moves and pivots because mm-hmm. eventually somebody will do exactly what you're doing for better, cheaper, faster. And if you're not already, if you're not anticipating that yeah. and looking at your next move or your next you'll mate, get gobbled up. Yeah, you'll get uh-huh. go, you'll get gobbled mm-hmm. up by somebody else. So. You know, it's a big challenge with uh, you know building your own success that I think about sometimes is how do you keep how do you keep your kids uh, or how do you make sure that they have the same uh, appreciation for things and drive and desire that you had? You know what I mean? Because being brought up in a successful household is very different, you know, monetarily, than being brought up in regular household and then become successful yourself. Like, do you ever think about that, Justin? Like, how mm. you would? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. How you I've would instill so- that sort of work ethic? Uh, yeah. You know, amidst. Um, <laughs> Like they they literally see what you have and you know and they recognize it and they recognize you know when you're bringing things home and whatnot and ask you like why why you know you don't have money like yeah, just my buy son me like yeah you like ask me that sometimes like this that's not the point you know like <laughs> like you have to earn this and like this is this is what this equates to so are your kids are you guys as kids at that age yet where they actually ask these types of questions like i've never mm-hmm. thought about that like have you had to like say no son you're not i'm not going to buy that for you and then go why dad you can't afford it or we can't do it like have yeah. you had to have these types totally. of totally yeah so, no, he did uh, ask me that so i don't um i don't like saying i can't afford it not because i don't want them to think i can't i can afford it but because what happens when I can't afford it? When they grow up and they, you know, and they realize if I can't afford something, like right, it's so not I'm an curious, affordability. I'm, I'm thing. curious to how you guys handle that. And what you say when it, when your kid asks to buy things that you think is frivolous? Yeah, I'm, or- st- I'm still trying to build the actual value of dollars to him, and so like having him go through certain chores or certain like uh, responsibilities, um, we start talking about how much he feels he should get paid, you know, for that specific task, and you know, we're starting really small. But I want to just kind of see where his level is as far as like what he thinks a dollar is worth. And like when he goes into the market, it's like, okay, this actually costs 15 or like, you know, his goal right now is to buy like this set, this Lego set that's like 55 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to kind of chart this out like, okay, um, you know, you help with the laundry and you're folding your clothes like we're willing to give you a dollar, you know, every time you do that. And so we're just starting with that, right? That's cool. And so he's he's kind of like stacking it up. He's got like seven bucks, and he's like super pumped, you know. <laughs> and uh, he's like oh, total can, slave I, labor over you here. Know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, next you're gonna knit me a sweater. Yeah, <laughs> I can't wait till he comes back. He learns Google. Yeah. He's like, Dad, minimum yeah. wage is seven fifty. Oh God, <laughs> he's all entitled. Yeah. <laughs> you're not paying me when I'm yeah. worth. Would that be great, you <laughs> asshole? Yeah. You yeah. know, you know what my uh, my ex is. Um, parents used to do to her when she was a young kid your guys' kids age i thought was really fascinating was when they asked for things you know video games tv knew this knew that whatever um and because she grew up in a very wealthy home like he was he, he made a lot of money and they had anything they needed so you know this obviously was a challenge for him with these her, her growing up mm-hmm. so she told me what her father would make make her do is that anytime they asked for something they had to write a paper on why Mm-hmm. So like if she wanted like a new TV or a new toy or a new dress or something like that, like 
you you would have her think it, think it out completely, put it on paper on why she needs that, and if she doesn't need it, why does she want it, and explaining that, and then he would actually have this dialogue with her as far as like so you get that critical thinking there yeah, yeah yeah which is along the lines that you guys are going with having them think about the the value of it and how you know how do you get $55 it's not as simple yeah. you don't just go ask dad and dad hands you $55 and that's it's not like I'm going to pay him every time he does you know the task and so I don't want to like I want I don't want to just pay him for everything No you're he helping does, right? him relate what what yeah. a dollar This is, is the first thing we're working on cuz he has a goal right? right so he still has to do other chores because he's a part of the family Mm -hmm. we all contribute in the family that's like a big thing with me like yeah. everybody does something yeah I, I, i've lately been talking to my because my son just turned 12 and so we've been talking about how he can potentially start a business even now yeah i was you brought this up this morning i'm glad you brought mm -hmm. this you, you're talking about this because i think this is really cool that you've got a boy at the age that is now asking kind of business type questions, which mm -hmm. I think would be so exciting as a yeah. father to. He to, was at because he came up with an idea on how to make money on YouTube, and mm. he was telling me how. Oh, and I asked him. I said, "Well, how do you think businesses make money on YouTube?" And he goes, "Well, through advertising." And I said, "That's true." Uh, and so, but I broke it down and I said, "You're going to need a lot of viewers yeah. to make a decent amount of money yeah. on advertisers, or you can come up with your own product." or your own service that you sell through your YouTube channel, which then requires far less customers. Mm -hmm. And so we were talking about, you know, uh, you know, per sale, you know, dollar amount, value, and we were, we were coming up with ideas and I was kind of breaking it down for him because I was trying to get his wheels spinning because I would love for him to try to start a business and for me to help him out just to teach him, you know, how things work and how difficult it is and to see him put his effort and energy towards you know, yeah. doing something. And then he also realm. has options, you know, like, you I mean, you want them to go through the educational process, but it's like, you know, you all can also learn by, you know, doing this job. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and my daughter's a little young for that, but I like to, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, cause I, what I got from my parents, my parents were both, uh, you know, immigrants. They were both very hardworking, but they came from the mentality that what you earned, you saved. Hmm. You saved and you didn't spend much, which is, you know, good old fashioned, classic, conservative, you know, um, money management. However, uh, when I was 19, 20, 21, and I was making six figures running gyms, all I did was take the money and save it because they didn't understand investments. They didn't hmm. get that because where they came from, you saved it. Yeah. So had, I wish I had somebody that taught me investments. Like, yeah, cool, here's some, you could buy this property, you could do this. And by now, I definitely would have far more assets had I known that yeah. at that age. So I'm trying to explain that to my son. In fact, I just had a conversation with him yesterday on- Wow, that's early. That's uh, awesome. Dude. I told him on inflation and I explained to him, you know, if you have a thousand dollars and you just save it in the bank, you know you're losing money, right? And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, this is how much interest you get from the bank, but this is what inflation is at. And in reality, you're actually losing money. Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Well, that sucks. Like, yeah. like, what do I do?" I said, yeah. "You have to figure out how to invest it so you make more, at least more than inflation, but you can make even more." And we were talking about that and going through that because I want him to understand that he can take his money, take his whatever you know, whatever he's earned, and turn it into more and have it work for him. Because I wasn't taught that; I had to learn that on my own later on. And uh, I think that's a valuable well, lesson to learn. That's interesting because I was just listening to a Joe Rogan podcast. He had this guy on who, you know, was an investor. Shift or whatever. Shift, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's talking about like the online, you know, the way that you can um, invest in gold and how you can trade gold. So it's like it's it's almost like an online like gold standard mm -hmm. that they're trying to recreate um, so you can easily sort of exchange it, but it's always a tangible thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like Bitcoin where it's like, well, cause gold doesn't inflate like, uh, yeah, like money. Like, no, dollar. it's gold is, yeah. Th there's always been something valuable about gold. Mm -hmm. Like we've all like for thousands of years. So mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense that, you know, they could, you know, that's something like worth looking into investment mm -hmm. wise for sure. No, it's a cool, my son's at a cool age right now. You know, I'm starting to see like he, he's not a kid anymore. He's starting to become like. <laughs> You know, kind of that teenager. So you can see, I can see his mind is working a little differently. Um, testosterone starting to go up, which is pretty funny. Like I was looking at him the other day, and I'm like, "Are you getting a 
<laughs> a little peach fuzz little, on your fucking fuzzy, lip. Fuzzy. Yeah, like what's going on there? <laughs> you know, it's pretty. Is it's his pretty, voice cracking at all? Not or? yet, because oh, yeah. he just turned twelve. You know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit more to go. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it's funny because you can see, I can see the testosterone starting to kick up a little bit. Uh, I can see, like we were in the pool the other day. Um, me, him, and my daughter we were playing, and he's roughhousing differently with me. Like more like a like a you know like an older boy would you know versus like a little kid. Oh wow! And he's fucking with me and he's jumping on me differently, which more aggressive, huh? More aggressive because it's a uh, and it's a natural instinct. You know, when testosterone goes up, uh, that's what we do. We start yeah. to fuck with each other, and uh, it's a lot of fun to see that. That's you know, funny, yeah. yeah, it's really really cool to see that. But it's but I also now I'm, like I don't let him go on his computer in his room by himself and do all that shit because. <laughs> Because I mean, I remember when I, you know, when that shit started hitting oh, for me. Man. Like, God forbid, I had access to the internet. Like, yeah, shit. how oh, do you police God. that with phones and th- stuff like that? Like, he's they- not allowed to have his computer um, I- anywhere where he's in his, like in his room with the door closed, or he can't take it in the bathroom or anything like that. Right? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> that's what I would be doing. <laughs> you, guys, you guys fucking laugh. That's no. what kids do. Oh my God, kids take that shit in the bathroom. No, I told you. I mean, I printed it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when the internet first now, came out. Now, like, has it, what was the first time you caught that? Did you catch him like walking to the bathroom with his laptop? Like you guys like, <laughs> oh, I'm just doing some work in yeah. here. <laughs> you know? No, so what are you doing? I, I, Have you, you know, caught it? Have you caught that yet? I don't know if he's seen anything or purposely looked up anything. I know he has a lot of friends. Oh. And here's the thing. When you're a kid, when you're especially when you're a young boy, uh, you know, like 12, 13, 14, then it really starts to get crazy. But... When you have a group of friends, there's always that one or two guys that's that are the lead. Oh, that's ahead yeah, of everyone. Yeah, that's sure. like they got older brother. That's, exactly. Yeah, and so showing them all this. So shit. my son's the oldest in our family, right? So he didn't have an older brother who's gonna show him the shit. But he does have friends who have older brothers. For sure. And so those are the ones I'm like, and I can, you know, and I know they cuss. Mm-hmm. I know that they, they cuss to each other because I've heard them playing video games and they'll be on the, you know, the well, they'll talk to each other. <laughs> and I'll hear and I'll hear his friends cuss and he'll look at me and I'll laugh. And I told him, we had a conversation. I said, look, I don't care if you guys cuss just around each other, but definitely don't do it around your sister and don't do it around other younger kids and don't do it around uh, your teachers because you'll get fucking big trouble. I said, and also, you know. <laughs> he said fucking fuck. Yeah. <laughs> and thing. I said, and, I mean, and, damn it. And learn, <laughs> and, Shit. And learn, like I told him, I said, and using bad words, you know, it's not, uh, it's not cool if you just use them all the time. Like learn how to use them or whatever. We had this conversation, but uh, I'm going to put parental controls on this computer and you're not allowed to. That's so funny. Room. That reminds me, like the, the group that I used to hang out with, fucking. They would use fucking for everything. Yeah, right. Because like, it's cool. You just like could use it, so you would put it in like every single conversation. It was. Mm-hmm. Like, I ridiculous. told you guys about my. I was only in third grade when I got in trouble for swearing. I was in third grade, and really? we were playing uh, wiffle ball out in front, and. That you know that was back when the is uh, it like with a wolf wiffle wiffle ball yeah wiffle wiffle ball you can't say oh, wiffle <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. can you say wiffle <laughs> wiffle ball there you go oh, yeah. there you go yeah. I like I like <laughs> wiffle ball better yeah, yeah, it's you have like a lazy tongue or something <laughs> <laughs> we were playing out we were playing outside the uh, principal's office and they had the window open. And th- that was at the age I had just learned how to cuss. Like you just started putting it together. And I oh, I, I remember know. this so much because I remember that you, I would just, you would swear and put them together all terrible. It wouldn't even make sense. You know, oh, yeah. every time I missed the ball, ball, fuck shit, ball, ball, yeah. ball, you know, just yelling stuff. And the window, and man, this, this shit on this vice principal girl comes out and she grabs me by my elbow and just yanks me and just pulls me in the office and. Called my mom. I was I did the in house suspension right for the day, and my mom came down and where did you learn all that? I learned that from you. Oh no! <laughs> Put her on blast, got her in trouble and stuff. Dude, so the, felt, I, when dude, I was, I remember the first time okay. I started. No, go, okay. So I was uh, fishing with my grandpa, and uh, like for some reason, I don't know what his problem was, but he hated catfish. Like he like had this weird like reaction. Like he would catch one because he like just wanted to catch trout, and so we're out there trying to catch trout in his little tin boat and uh he catches like this this big old catfish and he just takes it off the hook and he's like god damn it and he's like damn it and he's like slamming this thing against the side of the boat and like kills it and throws it back in oh the water god. i was like whoa <laughs> i was like you don't like catfish huh you know and we get back and um i remember like you're talking about using in a, using the words like the wrong way like we went 
uh, bike riding and my brother like cut me off or something. I got off and I was like, you damn head! Like in front yeah. of like, you know, my parents and like, oh, and then I got spanked in front of everybody. Did you, did you really? <laughs> it was bad, yeah. So when I, I was, uh, let's see, I was, uh, speaking of getting spanked, this is another story. I'll tell you guys, it's hilarious. I was 13, so you know, again, and this is what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for my son to hit the age where, and he's getting there now, where they start to, you start to feel like, cool, right? Like I'm fucking cool. Like you can't, like, okay, Dad, you can't spank me anymore because I'm cool now, right? right. You guys remember yeah. that when you yeah. hit that age? Right? Oh, yeah. You're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I or was- you would just look at him, yeah. right? They'd spank you, then you just look back Dude, at him. Dude, like, I, was, uh, yeah. I was 13 or 14, maybe 14 years old. And, you know, you think you're cool. You're with your buddies, and I'm playing basketball or whatever. We're at the, at the, at the elementary school. And my dad, is, uh, he comes over, and he's like, Sal, let's go. We got to go. And I'm like, hold, I just put my finger up. I didn't even look at him. I'm like, hold on. Like, <laughs> I'm not like I'm with my boys one minute, right now. One like, minute. hold on, yeah. right? <laughs> and uh, my dad, my dad fucking, oh, my dad you. walks over, yeah. grabs the basketball from the game, and throws it at me. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, in front of all my friends, he lost it. <laughs> he just he grabs it and he looks at me in my face, and I look at him. And I'm like, <laughs> and he tells goes, you with it, yeah, <laughs> boom, right? And I'm like, oh fuck! And, oh, I, no. and my friends are like, oh shit! Yeah. And my dad's like, let's yeah, go! And I, that. yeah, totally like punked me yeah. in front of all my friends. Oh, <laughs> but man. the first time I actually really cussed in front of my parents, I was actually older. I was 13 years old, and I was playing volleyball at a, a park. It was a big family party. And I don't know exactly what happened. I jumped and I landed and my foot landed in, in, in like a divot or something. My knee twisted and my kneecap actually dislocated. So my kneecap was on the outside of my leg. So I hear, you hear this dry like oh, crack, right? Ugh. And I fall down and then I look down at my knee. And if you've ever seen a dislocated kneecap, it looks it looks horrible. It looks really bad. Like oh, it's yeah. like my kneecap's here on the <laughs> yeah, side. Yeah, so like there's nothing in the front and the skin is all stretched. And I'm like... Oh fuck! <laughs> and so I proceed, and it hurt, right? So I proceed to cuss until the ambulance gets there. Mm. I'm like, "Fuck, fuck!" Ah! And everybody's <laughs> circle around me, and my mom comes down, and she kneels by me, and she's like, she, she knows I'm in pain, and she go, she tells me in my ear, she goes, "Watch your language, watch your language." <laughs> and I'm like, "Fuck, fuck!" And I kept cussing, and my cousin is looking at me up in the back behind someone else. He's looking at me like, stop cussing. And I didn't realize I was saying all these bad words <laughs> until the ambulance came and gave me some morphine. <laughs> yeah, and then I had a nice talking to. But that's uh, yes. uh, that was the first time. Oh, man. Old. Douglas, bring on uh, the cussing bird. The the motherfucking bird. shit fuck. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? is being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. Our first question is from Dudley underscore. What's the difference between conventional and sumo deadlifts? When should you use one or the other, or should you phase both? That's a good question. Yeah, mm -hmm. so one of them is done in a conventional style. The other uh, one is more of a sumo. No, but I, I, I think that, I think uh, where if you, if you look this up, like if you Google it and you start trying to figure this out, most of the stuff you'll read will talk about, um, you know, different people will... Um, uh, be able to do uh, one or the other better, right? For example, like some uh, some people, like I know Lane does a sumo stance, right? Like that is he he competes at that level, he trains at that level. Um, I don't even know if I've ever even seen him do a conventional deadlift before. So and because he he's in a a sport of uh, powerlifting. Uh, you want to continue to keep doing. He's going to go with his strongest. Yeah, exactly. That was already method. naturally strong for you, so you want to keep doing that right over and over and over. So because you want to get good at it. Now, when you're somebody who is training for aesthetics or overall performance or even mobility and you and functionality, doing both is is ideal and intermittently. So I pull a lot better conventional deadlift. That's just natural for me. But I, I sumo deadlift all the time, but I, I intermittently put it into my routine so that I get the benefits of training that way because it is awkward for mm -hmm. me and I and I and I want to challenge my body that way. I'm not gonna PR sumo, 
mm-hmm. because it's it just is it feels awkward and uncomfortable in comparison to conventional. But there are there are many benefits to do sumo squatting and sumo deadlifting is a are staple exercises that I actually put into routines for other people when I'm training them because uh, I have found that most people your uh, your your glute med is responsible for that external rotation of the femur. So putting your putting your toes out in a sumo position for whether you're squatting or deadlifting is different and awkward for a lot of people. And a lot of the times uh, when you see a person squat just normally, their knees cave in and they pronate. And uh, most of the time, that's because they, they don't have a lot of connection to their glute med and don't uh, activate that properly in the squat or the deadlift. And teaching them a sumo squat or a sumo deadlift helps people activate that more and get better control. And then you, I, I've noticed that I've been able to help people with the the uh, pronating of their foot uh, because they're they're not activating and turning on their glute mm-hmm. med. So that's a huge benefit of incorporating sumos if you don't do them. <clears throat> there, the, so I know we're so here's why there's a lot of confusion with these two uh, with conventional and sumo deadlifts. The confusion is because of powerlifting, okay? Right. Because in powerlifting, when you do a deadlift, they allow you to pick one or the other. They're interchangeable. And because of that, we've come to the conclusion, uh, this kind of unsaid conclusion, that they're both the same. Right. That, they're very oh, different. Oh, I deadlift. And nobody asks you, is it conventional or, dead or sumo? It'd be like me saying, oh, I do squats, but I do front squats. Mm. The reality is, uh, and this might even be controversial. I bet you, I'm going to get a lot of people who are going to make some com- very. I already know where you're going. They're yeah. very different they're, movements. They're yeah. different exercises. Very much so. Yeah, and and, and I'm sure it's going to sound uh, controversial to some people. Oh, no, I uh, mean, break it down mechanically. Yeah, when you I don't do, think, so. think about where when you do a wide sumo stance, it requires you. Now, it's totally different. It's a you, total different recruitment process. Yes, a total different. I mean, you are in both of them. You are using a lot of the posterior chain, of course. Yeah. But it's you're using more hips with <clears throat> conventional. You're getting uh, you need to have more flexibility in your hips in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, with the conventional, you're getting more erector spinae. You're getting a different activation in the in the lower body. Um, it's they're two different exercises. So I think you should treat them as both. Now, do they have a carryover to each other? Sure, they do. But just like a front squat will have a carryover to back squat and vice versa, mm. there's gonna be some carryover. But that doesn't mean that they're interchangeable. I don't like it when people say they're interchangeable because they're they're both two different exercises. Now, when I would recommend, first of all, in the grand scheme of things, if you're doing all kinds of different exercises and mobility work and all that stuff, then you can pick one and you'll probably be okay. But, but if you're more advanced, you've been working out for a while, my advice is to Focus on one sometimes and focus on the other one sometimes. Yeah. Like uh, sometimes in the same workout. Even add in like the hex bar, you know, and like yes. add in different different options. Like I'm I'm a big believer in challenging the angles as a variable as well, right? So uh, if I'm gonna do this this um, you know bilateral type loaded situation, like if I can adjust where my foot position is and really work on the mechanics from that and start ramping my way up again, you know, from that angle, I feel like then that also contributes. So mm-hmm. it's just it's a matter of like having a focus and and going through a phase of that three to four weeks or whatever you you sort of determine. And then, you know, switch out and work on, you know, another skill in a different angle. Now, biomechanically speaking, if we just look at biomechanics and leverage, the sumo deadlift should be the stronger lift for, I think, pretty much anybody. It should be. But for whatever reason, and I've heard different experts explain why this is not the case in reality, in real life, but it's supposed to be. Now, I know in reality and in real life, especially taller lifters, tend to do better conventional. I'm one of them. I lift mm. way more weight conventional than I can sumo. I can pull five plates right now, pretty much at any time conventional. Sumo, I'd have to train sumo for a little while yeah. before I can do what that. Wasn't the appeal with sumo is that like you're not really short range of yeah, motion. Short, shorter range. It's more biomechanically advantageous for the body. Mm. Um, I know women tend to like sumo uh, over over conventional. Shorter lifters tend to like sumo mm-hmm. over conventional. In, in powerlifting competition, they're interchangeable, so obviously pick the one that you're stronger at. But if you're training right. to get stronger overall, to build muscle <clears throat> overall, um, then you should you should do both. And I mean, the way I would program it, and we didn't put we didn't program like Maps Anabolic, for example, 
calls for a deadlift and I don't specify in there between conventional or sumo and people can pick. But when you get a little more advanced, the way I would do it is I would go, I would do a whole like 12 week cycle where I'm phasing, you know, like three phases. So like a strength hypertrophy and then a more of a strength endurance uh, phase. So like 12 week, a 12 week mega phase or whatever you want to call it, macro phase. And then I would do that with conventional. Then I'd go back around and then I'd stick to sumo because what happens and what you notice is when you get stronger at a particular movement, you'll typically see a corresponding uh, muscle growth. When you try a new variation of that movement, you'll see it, you'll be weaker, but then there's so much more potential in terms of growth. Right, right. And then you'll mm-hmm. see, you know, more muscle growth. So I've actually tested this. I've done this where I conventional deadlift for a long time. Then I go to sumo and I'm like stuck. At, oh, okay, I'll just start with 315 because I, I need to get used to this. And then I'll work up to 475, five plates on the sumo and I'll notice more muscle than I had before because I've had to get that recruitment pattern. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd I, say there, both of them. There, oh, absolutely. There's a lot of different ways. This is also why we encourage um, the in, interchanging of exercises, why the YouTube channel is designed to mirror the programs, to teach people other movements that they mm-hmm. can interchange into the within the program. I actually have used it like this, where when I'm running through any of our MAPS programs where we're going through a strength phase, I lean towards the one that I'm stronger at because I can push myself. I feel safer pushing myself with five plates and beyond in a conventional stance. I don't feel comfortable pushing myself five plates in on sumo. And so I incorporate the sumo deadlifts when I start getting in the higher rep range where I'm using a lighter weight Mm -hmm. and I feel I can focus more mechanically on what I'm doing. Now, I think that there's huge benefits to what Sal said by doing a whole cycle of that, and I think that would be great. But again, this is what's fun about you know programming and playing with mm-hmm. these type of things. I think without a doubt, if you're not doing both of them, you are for sure missing out. In my experience, uh, I have shaped a ton of butts using sumo deadlifts. I, I it's very common that I would I would train a a female client who could come to me and say, Adam, I want to work on my butt. And when I teach them a sumo deadlift, they're like, I've never done that before in my life. And I right away know that I'm going to give them a whole new look to their butt that they've never seen because that's a part of the glute that a lot of people do not activate. There's not a lot of movement. Or at least not in that know. way. No, know. exactly. There's not a lot Unless of movement. like caustic squats or you're going, you know, right. know like lateral lunges right. all the time. But, right. Yeah. And so it's, it literally, and it, the way where the glute mead sits or the part of it that is part of your glute, it really gives that shape to like, so if I have a girl who has kind of a, and a guy, this counts for guys too. I'm just speaking to women because I've had more women come to me asking specifically for help in building their ass is you get like these this narrow hips where they they don't have a lot of width to their butt where you can see it from the front and when you really start to build the the glute meat you start to see it's that three dimensional yeah it, it creates a three it does create a three dimensional ass and it does add a lot more shape uh, to it and so if you're somebody who is looking uh, for the aesthetic piece like abs- this is this has to be in your training if you're trying to build that lower half so if you're guy or a girl looking to build a butt you got to get those sumo squats yeah. and deadlifts yeah so another thing too the way i've used it in the past uh it, when i'm trying to because i love deadlifting and for a little while there i was just trying to push and see how much weight i could lift and when i would get to a sticking point is when i would do a cycle of something else so when i'd get a sticking when i got to a sticking point with conventional there you go That's a great i would do sumo too. for a while and then when I'd see my strength go up, 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 up with sumo and I started to slow down there, then i go back to conventional. And that same thing with the uh, with the trap bar or the hex bar. Yeah. In fact, I pulled 600 pounds trap bar way before I was able to pull it with the straight bar. Um, but I w- but that was definitely a, played a role in my ability to be able to pull that much weight mm-hmm. conventional. And when I got my sumo uh, up to five plates, that's when I was getting my my conventional into the high fives um, was only when I was able to do that. So... For the people listening right now who really want to build strength, like if you're stuck at your deadlift, you know, p- switch to the other style, whether you're already sumo, go to conventional. If you're conventional, go sumo. Train like that for a while. And start slow, by the way. Mm, I want yeah. to be clear. Like, oh, yeah. don't go fucking ripping some heavy ass <laughs> weight because you'll hurt yourself. 
Uh, start slow. Give yourself some weeks to build up. Um, but once you start pulling some pretty good weight with that new style, and go the, back to your old style, style see what happens. That tip you just gave is the reason why I normally recommend it in the third phase. In a phase where we're doing you know 10 repetitions yeah, yeah, or yeah. more, so you know you have to go a lighter weight, and so mm-hmm. it kind of forces people to lighten up and go fo- focus more mechanically. Quick commercial break. Hey, people ask us all the time how they can support Mind Pump. Here's what you can do. Uh, you can go to www.brain.fm forward slash mind pump and get 20% off Brain FM for meditation or focus. You can also go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump and get a 30 day trial plus one free audio book. Lastly, you can go to getnatureblend.com forward slash mind pump and you will get a discount on Ben Greenfield's CBD product. Jennifer831, can you talk about cortisol? What it is? what effects it has, and what you can do to keep it at a healthy level. Cortisol. Uh, evil cortisol, right? Know. Everybody yeah, talks about... a bad name. Yeah, right? everybody talks about cortisol as, as it being this horrible, dangerous hormone. It's a uh, stress hormone. Mm-hmm. It causes How do we lower muscle it? loss, fat you know, gain, all these other things. Cortisol is a very, very, very important hormone in the body. Uh, it uh, helps regulate uh, blood sugar it helps uh, regulate the immune system. It uh, helps metabolize uh, fat, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, it's uh, it gives you energy. Um, you naturally should have a spike in cortisol in the morning when you first wake up. In fact, it, there's a lot of uh, functional medicine doctors will test you for this, and if they see that your cortisol levels are too low in the morning, then they think maybe you have some issues with your uh, with your HPA access. Access, excuse me, and uh, they need to start working on it. So, cortisol itself, um, again, it'll raise in response to stress. If it's continuously elevated all the time, you can have some negative effects. But I think what we're starting to discover is it's not so much the cortisol levels that we need to be careful for, it's becoming uh, losing sensitivity to it, mm. like we would with insulin. Um, when we when we start to get diabetes, and this is so very it's, fascinating. So it's the constant spike of it versus actually having it. Spike. Right. So in the past, for example, um, or even now, you still hear this. You still hear the term adrenal fatigue, mm-hmm. and uh, I know a lot of Western medicine doctors laugh at that. Um, I think, uh, in fact, I think Lane had a doctor. Lane Norton had a doctor on a friend of his who made fun of the term adrenal fatigue because there's no evidence that the adrenals get fatigued and that your body stops producing. Uh, you know, hormones like cortisol. Um, but I think what's happened is we've observed the side effects or symptoms of el- too much constant levels of stress, which is constant fatigue, inability to get your body, re- you know, revved up, um, you know, all the symptoms that you would cho- associate with adrenal fatigue. And so then they named it adrenal fatigue because they had a theory around it. But I think what may be happening hmm. is because people have these constant elevated levels of cortisol that their body becomes insensitive to it and their receptors start to downregulate, um, not unlike what happens with, uh, you know, uh, resistance to things like leptin or to um, insulin. And so in those particular cases, you'll find people uh, requiring higher and higher doses of stimulants to, um, and that, by the way, is a good that's a somewhat decent way of knowing that your body may be dealing with some cortisol resistance mm. is that you need more and more artificial forms of, you know, quote unquote, artificial forms of cortisol. For example, if you absolutely need coffee in the morning, not that you enjoy it, but you have to have it or you're dead tired all day long. <laughs> this is like all sounding like me. <laughs> yeah. It could mean that your body's becoming insensitive to cortisol. So yeah. you're in the morning, you're getting your cortisol spike but your body's just not responding to it. So you're having to supplement it with, you know, all this, all this other cortisol. It's interesting. Yeah. I just, cause I, I think I told you guys a long time ago, I had to have my, um, one of my adrenal glands removed because it it had a tumor on it. And then like, I know it's probably not related, but like ever since then it's felt like this, you know, constant battle for me, you know, with, with trying to get energy and trying to get this 
um, exactly what, how you're kind of describing like what levels you should be at in the morning. It's like so bad in the morning for me, uh, like in comparison to the rest of my entire day. So that's something I should definitely look into. I mean, it, it, it really does to, you know, manage the immune system as well. It's, uh, you know, uh, it is anti-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. It's an anti-inflammatory. Now, too much of it all the time can cause lots of problems, but having too low cortisol is now, what, not a what, good thing. what's your thoughts on, like, you know, supplements like reishi or ashwagandha that's, like, in our Organifi supplement? Like, are, are, do things like this benef- benefit... Uh, somebody who has issues with cortisol. So here's why I like certain supplements uh, or certain herbs that are uh, considered adaptogens. In that, it, I like them because they don't uh, directly lower cortisol in the sense that I can't give you this and just slam your cortisol down. What they do do is they help your body uh, be uh, kind of homeostasis. So if you have constant high levels of cortisol and you're in this constantly stress state, then we do see a depression in cortisol. Hmm. If you're in this state with low cortisol all the time, they actually may help raise it. They help balance it. Ashwagandha is a great supplement for this. I know the Mm -hmm. green juice uh, uh, has some of this in there. Um, And I would consider the green juice, just based on what's in there, to be a decent, um, you know, uh, adaptogenic type Supplement. Well, do you think that's because I was you were asking me because I've been really consistent with taking it now for about <laughs> you a were month. saying you notice more energy from it. Yeah, yeah. that's what and I, it's not a stimulant. There's no stimulants in there. Yeah, no, but I, I def I've I feel yeah. really good and it and it doesn't feel like a caffeine high or energy. It just feels this good, sustained, even kill. Yeah, that's interesting you mentioned that because I was attributing it to maybe I, my uh, consumption of vegetables wasn't as high enough, like my serving size amount, you know. And so I was like kind of going through that, like maybe, you know, that's why I'm feeling more energetic, but, you know, maybe it's also. Well, like, that's why I'm thinking the same thing too, though. Yeah. It could be because that's how I supplement and use it, is I typically base it off of, okay, how am I doing as far as my, my green intake? And the, for example, that's why I was doing one to two of them every day when I was on the boat was because it was like I can't there was no vegetables out there whatsoever yeah. so I want to make sure I was getting that and so I was looking at it more like a micronutrient uh deficiency and making sure I'm getting everything mm-hmm. I need but I'm wondering if it maybe have some sort of a knowing our lifestyle um all of us in this room um and the way we work and then how busy our lives are and the, how active our minds are I would not uh, I would that's what I would bet I would bet that it's probably yeah. balancing out uh, your system a little bit and, and acting as an adaptogenic. I mean, what we have to mm. remember is that the body, when it's balanced, you're going to operate your best in all things. Mm-hmm. You're just going to feel your best. And it's going to feel like it's different than stimulant energy. Like I know the difference between having a good dose of caffeine or another stimulant versus having this natural kind of energy. Well, yeah, because you'll get jittery and it's like, you know, you get like overly stimulated and it, it, you really don't feel good. It doesn't feel like good, like productive energy anyways. Right. It's yeah. not a hyper energy. It's just a, you feel good and feel healthy type of energy. And that's what you want uh, when your body's balanced out. So um, yeah, they, 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 you know, ashwagandha, reishi does this. There's other adaptogenic herbs. I know Siberian ginseng, uh, for some people, will do that. There's um, other mushrooms that can do the same thing. Um, but again, the the reason why I like the way these work is if you give ashwagandha to an otherwise healthy person, they don't get like they're not going to see major changes. Yeah, you're going to see it if you're stressed out. Here's some clues, by the way, um, to to knowing that you may have um, some kind of a dysfunction in that kind of HPA access or maybe having you know, some kind of cortisol resistance. If you find yourself needing more and more stimulants, if you find that you have sleep disrupt- disruptions, even though you're exhausted, so you could be very, very tired, but then find yourself waking up in the middle of the night or not, like, God, I'm so tired, but I can't get a good night of sleep. Or you do get sleep and you wake up and you still feel tired. There's also some behavioral effects that people are speculating. For example, you may place yourself in stressful situations, not realizing that what you're seeking is a cortisol release because you need more cortisol. For example, People with cortisol resistance, or adrenal fatigue, whatever you want to call it, will find themselves being late more often to appointments. And that's literally because when you're late to something, you get a little high, oh, fuck, I'm late, and you get this kind uh-huh. of- You get so adrenaline. You get a little spike. bit of a cortisol spike. Yeah. Um, you that's know, funny. Say, yeah. say, so subconsciously, you end up doing that? <laughs> you're sabotaging yourself just you so are, you get up. You are also, a lot of times, you'll seek out 
higher intensity workouts. Mm. And we know this because well, yeah, we as, see all the time. Yes. You've got these people that are in these high stress states that are living on 15 cups of coffee a day. And the kind of workout that they think they feel best doing <coughs> is the super high intensity spin themselves. class or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you tell them, hey, that's not good for you, they'll argue with you and be like, I feel so great afterwards. The reason why you so feel you feel so great right after is because you've already you just pushed your body to squeeze out more cortisol yeah. and now you feel normal because you have all these down regulated receptors to cortisol but in reality what you're doing is you're just you're kicking the can down the road and you're making the problem worse and worse and worse till when you get to the point where nothing is going to do that for you so cortisol is an important hormone to look at but so are all the other hormones yeah, too little all... isn't good too high isn't good it and seemed... having it high at the wrong times isn't good either yeah they all, they all work together. They have, I mean, yeah. You have to have them. Next question is from Foxy Lifts. How effective are nootropics for someone with ADHD? Oh, yeah. The, the modern... The synthetic one? Uh, I guess any nootropics, but maybe we could talk about... Yeah, let's talk about all of them. The synthetic and the... You know, here's the interesting thing about ADHD and ADD. Uh, diagnosis for both of them has skyrocketed. <laughs> well, it didn't exist. Like self -diagnosed. How many years ago did it not exist? It wasn't even that long ago. Uh, when we were kids. When we were kids, uh, it first started kind of becoming a thing. Um, does that mean it doesn't exist? Uh, no, I think, I think ADD and ADHD exist. However, um, and this is my own personal experience, both working with kids... It's kind of like wandering uterus. Yep. <laughs> that I saw your post the other day. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. That was an old diagnosis from uh, <laughs> they used to they used to call or I, hysteria. I was I was the one of the books I oh, finished hysteria, talked about the uh, the evolution of the solely sidetrack here, right? But it just yeah. made me think of that because I was thinking about things that we diagnose people with that uh, like we laughed about 20 years or 50 years or 100 years later, right? Like, is this uh, going to be something that we kind of chuckle about like you idiots? We just were fucking distracted as fuck because of all these electronical devices and this and that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this will be one of those things. So back in the late 1800s, you know, if women had hysteria, nervousness, anxiety, stuff like that, they would diagnose them with uh, wandering uterus, and then you would see wandering the doctor, uterus. and the doctor would he, like like the, masturbate. Yes, the doctor the would. The doctor yeah. would use a vibrator. On the yeah, yeah. Well, first he did it manually. He would he'd help her orgasm, and then in the, <laughs> the evolution of the vibrator was they created this tool where they would use the vibrator on her to help her get organized. And they did that for many years. And it was yeah, extremely just making all kinds of appointments. And you know. what the only reason why it stopped was because, you know, companies came out later and approved the at-home version, the battery-operated at-home version, which was actually one of the first five electrical appliances that you could buy up there wow. with toasters mm -hmm. and things like that. And, and women around the world rejoiced. Well, you could buy it for $5, and back then, a doctor visit and your orgasm through your doctor would cost you about $3 for the visit, $2 for your orgasm, and it would be- That's cheap. <laughs> so now you could get that uh, at home as many times as you possibly want. And so, so convenient. So it pretty much uh, evolved this uh, this whole you know wandering uterus that existed for <laughs> oh, me. Oh, good. Yeah. Right? So, we don't want those uteruses And it was very around. successful at treating hysteria and wandering uterus. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very. Very effective. I'm, I'm yeah. cured. Lots of good feedback. You imagine yeah. that you're with your girlfriend yeah. or your wife or whatever, and you're just like, you know what, honey? You're being hysterical. Yeah. Throw, throw her a vibrator. <laughs> Go take care of yourself real quick. That'll make uh, you better. I'm using that. I no, mean, it's, that it, it works in our household. Anytime Katrina's irritated <laughs> yeah. or frustrated, just like go that. into the drawer. Yeah, yeah. Hey. I knock out an orgasm or two for Do her. Do we she need a little time? Always Do seems we? to be happy after yeah. that. Yeah. It works really well. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah, ADD, ADHD. Here, my thoughts on it are, I think it exists, but I also think we're over-diagnosing the fuck out of it. I think there's a lot of kids and a lot of adults with shitty diets, low activity, right. poor sleep. And by the way, do you, do you know what some of the symptoms of having a poor diet, low activity, and poor sleep are? Exactly the same symptoms you'll find with ADD and ADHD. Um, and there are many, there are several studies now that show getting kids to exercise, re reducing their consumption of certain foods, in particular sugars, uh, uh, processed, uh, highly processed foods, you all of a sudden notice better concentration and all those mm -hmm. different types of things. So before we talk about supplemental treatments for ADD and ADHD, these single most effective things you could do to help yourself with your inability to concentrate is get good, yeah, get, get good sleep, yeah. eat better, and move, and you'll find... 
all of a sudden, holy fuck, I can concentrate. Look, I'm I've been diagnosed with ADD. I got diagnosed. Well, as this an adult. is another one of those Same. situations where we're not addressing the root cause. Yeah. You know, leave it to Western medicine to diagnose you with something like ADHD, wandering uterus, whatever the fuck it is, and we want to prescribe something to uh, for that exact you know acute issue. When in reality, we're not addressing what the root cause probably is. So it's not to say that your kid does or doesn't have ADHD. Very well, he could be, and that could be mm-hmm. a fair diagnosis. But really, instead of giving him some sort of pills or nootropics or supplement or something for that trying to figure out what is causing the ADHD, which, yeah. like you said... Well, and even then, I get kind of a little controversial with my thought process with, you know, uh, especially with kids and, like, that being the, the environment that they have to abide by. Like, as they're sitting in class and, mm-hmm. you know, it's a kid that, like, needs to move. Like, it, like they have all this energy and you're Dude. trying to stifle that and, like, get them to just focus, you know, on this one thing. And, like, they're a kid. You know, they're a kid and they, they got all this like, like, let's get them to move more. Like to, they're decreasing activity for recess. They're decreasing, you know, extracurricular sports, like all this. And they want them to be a better student. Like that doesn't make any fucking sense. You to know, me. you know, one of the other characteristics of uh, ADD or ADHD is the ability to hyperfocus. No joke. I'm not making this up. Like uh, kids or adults with ADD or ADHD or have been diagnosed also have the ability to hyper focus on something. Right, find something they love and watch how fucking amazing that kid yeah. is. Right, like. right to the point where the, where you could fucking blow. You know, you could fire a gun next to them. They won't even reckon, realize it because they're so focused on what they're doing. Yeah. Um. So and when we look, it used to be called rambunctious. It used to be called you know energetic I or that or, term. Yeah. You know that or that distracted or whatever. And, and more far more boys, far more boys. Oh, I don't yeah. I don't know what the exact number is. But far more boys are diagnosed with these two things than girls. And part of it is that the fucking classroom and modern lifestyle is designed is better for girls. That's going to be a controversial uh, subject, but it's fucking true. It it is true. It's very true. It's been proven in many psychological studies that boys have a tougher time sitting down and being in these in these like traditional school environments they do better moving and you know touching and doing types of things kids in general tend to learn that way so i think you're right justin you put people in this environment and you you're going to want to fucking go crazy and then now fast forward to modern lifestyle as an adult it mirrors it really it, you're sitting at your desk all yeah. day long you're eating shitty food uh you're distracted at lunch on your phone you probably get crappy sleep like uh, you know i would i would venture to say a huge majority of your issues, if you have these, you know, ADD or ADHD, will be solved with, uh, or can be, you know, mitigated with those types of things. That all being said, uh, you know, I look as an adult, I got di- diagnosed with ADD, and I, it was basically for fun. Like I went to the doctor, and there was this no <laughs> joke. Something you do on the weekends? Th- no joke. There was a fu- there was a poster in her office. I went for something else. I don't remember what it was for. There was a poster in her office. Like, do you have the following symptoms? You may have adult ADD and I'm in there and I'm thinking like I want to get some Ritalin like I heard heard that shit's fun (laughs) I'm not not bullshit drug seeker so I sat so I sat in the office and I said hey I think I have ADD now if if I think about it I I I do fit the category of ADD I am one of those people that totally can totally you guys know me hyper focused yeah yeah, you guys know me I could totally do it distracted so I said uh squirrel uh, so I told the doctor that and so the doctor had me do a questionnaire and I fucking, like, I think nine out of ten questions, she's like, oh, yeah, you definitely do. Here, try this. And I'm like, oh, cool. I'm going to get my hands on some legal meth, right? Because that's what those drugs are. And instead, she gave me some other bullshit that made me feel crappy, and then I never went back. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, uh, man. but that's how that's how it was. That's how kind of easy it was. And uh, if I think about it, the characteristics that I have that also make me have ADD are the characteristics that make me really fucking good at the things I do. Right, totally. You know what I'm saying? Like podcasting or working in a gym and selling memberships and promoting and leading a team and doing those types of things. Like, I think those characteristics are really good. So that all being said, uh, can nootropics help with ADD? Anything that is going to give you a dopamine boost theoretically should help you with focus if you have ADD or ADHD because... They've identified a uh, that a dopamine dysfunction is at the root cause. What they think the root cause of ADD and ADHD. So, so anything- then, what's your thoughts on something like that? When we were just got done talking about cortisol and caffeine and pairing the nootropics like we do with our Chimera coffee that we're attached to 
what are your thoughts on someone like that that has ADHD that is incorporating the coffee that has the natural ones in there? Caffeine will definitely – caffeine is a classic uh, <clears throat> way to boost uh, – to help people with ADD and ADHD uh, symptoms. Mm-hmm. Anything that's going to be – like I said, anything that's going to release, release excuse me, dopamine – and cause that that release in the brain is going to help uh, people, you know, get that focus. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what, all the supplements, none, none of none of them are going to compare to what I what I just said with nutrition, yeah, exercise, sleep, and sleep. Rest, yeah. I mean, it makes such a fucking big yeah. difference uh, to do those things. So, um, and you know, here's the thing too with nootropics, uh, especially the synthetic ones, is you build up a tolerance to them. So, mm. I can have caffeine. And become more focused with it. But if I have caffeine all the time, not only do I start losing the effect, but I start getting uh, negative effects. And then I start to get worse focus with caffeine. Mm. So like I'm fucked if I have it and I fucked if I not have it. And I got to let myself, you know, my, my, my receptors for it down regulate and all that stuff. So, um, I mean, interesting topic. I guarantee we're going to piss some people off because I know there's people who are parents of children. Mm-hmm. And as a parent, the last thing you want to hear is that you're giving your kid a drug for something that can be solved with your parenting um, because that's what they hear. But uh, I I didn't say it was easy, right? Having your kid, you know, especially today's, you know, having them eat a certain way. By the way, your kids can also be affected by certain dyes and preservatives in food that can cause ADD and ADHD-like symptoms in kids. I had a, a kid that I trained who had to stay away from red dye number 50, I believe it was. Oh, wow. Anything with that, and he was fucking... No way. Yeah, dude. It, he was a 10-year-old kid, and his mom told me, and even the doctor uh, huh. had recognized it, if he had anything with this red dye, he would get really bad ADD and ADHD. So, Do they do like an elimination diet yeah, to identify that? Yeah, that's it. They did yeah. an elimination diet, and they tested it several times. God, isn't that such like well, the, which, the best you know protocol for a you, lot of and you And you didn't recommend that, which I think you yeah. have to for things like this. When you're trying to get down to the root cause of what you know what's flaring this up in your kid or yourself, if it's for yourself, is the elimination diet, I think, is I if I can't get to the bottom of something with somebody who's like dealing with some sort of chronic issue or something like this, I say, okay, well, let's do the elimination diet and then we're going to slowly introduce things and then pay close attention to. We are in a society that is a Medicaid uh, society. It is a yeah. let's get rid of the symptom mm-hmm. with this pharmaceutical or, or whatever medication. And that is because... The money, the money is driven by that. So that's the direction of all the learning and the teaching. So it's kind of, on the one hand, it's awesome that we figured out ways to mitigate symptoms. But on the other hand, it has forced us to ignore the, root, the cures for these root problems. And you have to ask yourself, if I have these symptoms and I solve and I help fix that symptom with a medication... I haven't changed what is causing that thing to happen in the first place. Yeah. And I should look there. I should look to that. You know, you just keep continually treating the symptoms. I'm telling you, they, they do studies on depression, on mild to moderate depression. Mild to moderate depression treated with exercise and nutrition uh, and head to head, you know, and head to head trials does as well in the sh- in, and then better in the long term than SSRI drugs. Hmm. In, in, for mild to moderate depression, and yet we people there's like a tremendous amount of people that are prescribed, you know, med, you know SSRIs, which have a whole host of different uh, side effects. Not to mention behavioral changes. That's the thing you want to understand too. When you're taking these medications that are altering your brain chemistry, uh, in very subtle ways, it is uh, changing your behavior. So in very subtle ways, it is changing who you are, hmm. and especially when you're a kid, when the brain is developing. Some of these changes can be long term. Pretty impactful, yeah. They can be. So uh, there's very few symptoms that you you won't see a tremendous improvement upon by fixing the three things that I said: nutrition, exercise, and sleep. You work on those three things, and you should see a dramatic reduction in, in most of your chronic symptoms. Quick commercial break, you guys. We keep getting asked all the time, "How can I support the Mind Pump family?" Here's one of the best ways you guys can. You guys love that Chimera Coffee that we have. Chimera Coffee with a K. You go to ChimeraCoffee.com. Put in the discount code Mind Pump for 10% at the checkout. If you guys have not tried Ben Greenfield's new bars out, they're fantastic. If you want some, go to BenGreenfieldFitness.com forward slash Nature Bite. Put in the code Mind Pump and get 10% off. Go check it out. Next question is from Jay Cisneros. 
Does the way you cook your food matter nutritionally? For example, boiling, baking, steaming, barbecuing, or raw? This is Ooh, the, the only question. reason why I feel like this is a good question is for the vegetable side of things because I think there is a big myth around well the, the carcinogens and like you know how everybody's so oh, you're scared talking about barbecuing? of yeah. Well, I was just thinking like because you know you brought up Dr. Mercola and how he like he, he boils right, he yeah. steams and he won't like yeah yeah. There's the whole like if you if you uh, cook something over a flame that produces carcinogens in the food and therefore that's a not a good way to prepare your food so it's better to prepare it in ways that don't produce carcinogens now the way i look at it is uh we that's probably the way we cooked all of our food for most of human civilization yeah. so we evolved like i don't i don't how else did we prepare our meat you know what I mean? When yeah. we were cavemen. Yeah, we had to burn it to, to get, kill all the bacteria. Well, not just the bacteria, but to make it digestible. Like, well, that too, yeah. The, 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 the reason why we're able to consume, as humans, consume the amount of meat that we are, that we do consume, is because we cook it. If we didn't cook it, like try and go eat raw red meat, you'll get a little bit, and then the rest of if you eat too much, you make yourself sick because you can't, you didn't break it down uh, with cooking. So um, there's a lot of that controversy when it comes to, to cooking food that I don't necessarily buy. Hmm. Um, same yeah, thing with that's why I said this is a splitting hair thing for yeah, me. Yeah. And the only time I talk about it to somebody is that because there's a lot of stuff around, uh, you know, raw vegetables, you yeah. get so much more nutrients. And I know you've addressed this before on the show that, yeah, sure, you get more nutrients from raw vegetables than you do from boiling or steaming your vegetables but then you can you can digest and eat more of the ones that are boiled so then it's a wash mm -hmm. yeah. so if it, you know somebody who eats you know three cups of raw vegetables your body is not going to be able to fully assimilate all of that versus somebody who has one one to two cups or three cups of that boiled he's going to be able to assimilate all of that and here's something else you want to consider uh if food intolerances um sometimes you can have an intolerance to a food if it's raw but you won't have an intolerance to it if you cook it um, and so this is true for like eggs, for example. Egg is it whites. more example that is it more common that direction than the other direction? Uh, so is it more common that you'll have? It's more common that you'll have an intolerance to something that's raw than if it's cooked. Like uh, um, uh, God, the nightshade vegetables, right? Like eating a raw tomato for some people will destroy their gut, but if you cook it in sauce. Then it just it, because the cooking process destroys that whatever you're. Oh, and to. the way you would know that is if you're somebody who has an intolerance because you have the tomato versus someone who has like ketchup because ketchup they go through the whole boiling process of cooking the ketchup. I, see, the, I'm the like that with uh, certain vegetables. So like uh, raw spinach, I can handle a certain amount, but mm. not a ton because then it bothers me. Cooked spinach, I can eat a fuck ton of it, and it's not a problem. Um, and like you said, the your ability to assimilate the food makes a big difference as well. But there are benefits. There are benefits to eating some things raw. Most uh, wellness experts will say it's good to have a variety. See, mm. here we go. It's like that's yeah, always the answer, know, right? right? That's always the answer. Like having a variety, cooking your food a variety of different ways is going to probably yield you a benefit uh, in, in, in lots of different ways. Like mm. uh, boiling your vegetables, you're probably going to be able to eat a lot more of them. You'll get a lot more fiber. It's a lot more digestible. Uh, raw, you're going to get more intact uh, enzymes and certain nutrients. Um, cooking your meat uh, over a barbecue might have some benefits and detriments versus boiling it versus you know uh, uh, baking it. Um, so I, I would say um, there's definitely there's most likely a benefit to doing uh, a, a variety of them, yeah. but in particular with vegetables. Like I try to have a little bit of raw vegetables every day, but most of the vegetables that I eat are either steamed uh, or boiled. I almost always, my meat is almost always uh, baked in the oven or barbecued. I never really prepared. Do you guys ever boil meat? I do. do no. What do you boil? I, I actually do. I actually Ugh. boil meat a lot. I boil meat or crock pot meat a lot. Uh, well, not a lot. A lot like, crock pot, it, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty, uh, but I actually like, um, so one of my favorite dishes to do, I did this a lot when I was competing is um, we would boil a huge pot of chicken and then we shred the chicken. Mm. And then, well, you showed me this a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, shred, I shred the chicken, uh, season it a little bit, and then I do like, I basically make a burrito bowl without, so I use the, ch the chicken, the rice, avocado, and uh, a little bit of green salsa. That was like a staple meal of mine when I was competing because it would taste amazing. And the boiled chicken, it like makes the chicken really, really soft and, and easy to eat, and then it's easy to shred. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, I, I boil meat. I eat uh, I eat a lot of uh, raw sashimi, so I do a lot of uh, raw salmon. 
but then I also cook a, a ton. So I I boil, I barbecue, I steam, I I bake. I literally cook my food all. I I what I don't buy into is camps on this. Like yes. the, oh, don't do something like the McCullough. the raw I, diet. I love or... Dr. McCullough, but then I'm also not going to be telling people to not cook their food over open flame because I'm with you, Sal. That well, until you're worried about Wi-Fi. You yeah, I mean? yeah. Once there's, you're worried about Wi-Fi, yeah, you're on that level, right? There's levels of this, yeah. and I, I mean, even at the level that I've gotten, as far as you know, being particular about my food and, and rotating it, and things. There's so many other things that I can do to uh, make my diet better than worrying about am I baking or boiling this today. I think where you get into any sort of danger if you become somebody who is in a camp where all you do is only boil your food or all you do is only eat raw this or or never eat raw and you always – so I think the, the, the right answer is to to just to rotate as much as possible. From a nutritional – because the real question is does this matter nutritionally? You're really splitting hairs on the difference. Like it, you know, what's the difference between a raw salmon – uh, protein wise versus salmon that has been, you know, barbecued or baked, like the amount of uh, nutrients or protein. Cause you've heard people say, Oh, you cook all the protein out if you burn it. Or if you, if you have your steak well done versus having a medium rare, like, you know, Oh, you're going to cook all the protein out. Like, no, you're not going to cook all the protein out mm. by having, even though I wouldn't recommend having a Katrina ruins or steak like that. Oh, well done. Yeah, I tease Come her. Every, every time we go to a fancy restaurant. I will make fun of you. We go to a fancy restaurant. I do every time. And, they, <laughs> and when she orders it, just ruin the steak for her, please. Like, <laughs> just, ruin, just, just ruin the $50 just, steak no, I'm buying her right now. Flames yeah, everywhere on good. it. Yeah. So, but she still gets plenty of protein in there. It's not even worth uh, haggling over how much she's losing or not losing over cooking it You know, well done or whatever. So I, I don't think it's... Uh, worth even discussing or getting mm-hmm. into uh, uh, yeah. with a client or teaching people other yeah. than that, you know, rotate. Do Pro- probably the worst way to cook would be what? Frying, right? I would yeah. assume yeah, deep yeah. frying. Well, but if you do do that, Especially use, how you have to use. Yeah, you want to use a, a highly high saturated fats. Like you want to use uh, like beef tallow or lard or, uh, you know, coconut oil maybe even. Um, I don't think you can fry with coconut oil. You can't, huh? No, you can't fry with coconut oil, avocado oil. That's it. That's you want to fry with like a legit like animal fat. Yeah, because those are the only ones that are stable. Yeah, Yeah. right. They're stable at that high temperature. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. you start to get you get fats that start to change and become very inflammatory. Very Mm -hmm. inflammatory. So I would say, yeah, I would say frying is probably. The one you want to, for the most part, yeah, not. You not can a do good without. Idea. It's pretty much you can do yeah. without completely. There's you no, can do without it, it's yeah. yeah. There's no need to fry. Let's put mm-hmm. it that way. You can get all the benefits, that because any sort of benefits you could potentially get from frying in some of the lard or fat. I mean, you could you could do that it's without gonna negate a lot. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, and you could do that without actually frying the food. So. Yeah, cooking is interesting because uh, again, you know, we're as humans as we evolve, we, our brains became so massive and our jaws became smaller, and our di- digestive tract is relatively short and small. Um, and it, it's because we learned how to cook food. We learned how to pre-digest it with heat so that we could then eat it and, you know, because... We don't need three stomachs. Yeah, yeah. Be- exactly. Because, you know, uh, the food, the, the nutrient content of food is important. It is. Like raw vegetables for sure have more nutrients than cooked vegetables do. But are you able to assimilate them? Are you able to take them into your body and process them? Is your body able to break them down um, like they would if you cooked them? And the answer is no. I mean, you know, go ahead and tr- go. You know, if you're listening right now, you want to do a little experiment. Go try and eat, you know, a, two cups of raw broccoli, and then you know, make sure you're next to the toilet because you're gonna have you know stomach pains, cramps, and you'll probably crap yourself because you, you can't digest all that you know that fiber in that particular way. But could you eat two cups of cooked broccoli? there's a good chance you probably could. And as far as carcinogens are concerned, you know, with the barbecuing, uh, you know, that's just one of those things that, look, exercise creates carcinogens in your body too. I know. Yeah. You know, it causes inflammation and carcinogens, but we know that it's a, it's a healthy process. So that's why I'm still, uh, you know, I'm decided that barbecuing is perfectly fine until I see an actual connection between, in, yeah. with good controls between barbecue. Like you did it for not. like every single meal that you ever ate, you know, for like years. Like yeah. Maybe then you I don't could know. see an impact. I, mean, that's I how, don't know. That's how we ate though, right? Like, I know. I don't, I still don't even see like that you'd have that much impact. I mean, what did, what did we even boil things in? We didn't have. <laughs> yeah, you know, pots and pans didn't come till later. No, it was all over a flame. So yeah, I highly doubt um, barbecuing yeah. is necessarily a bad thing. Unless maybe you're barbecuing on, I don't know, you know, over some kind of weird charcoal or something that's. 
or you know the fake what do you, what do you spray oh, on there? Oh, yeah, a lot of lighter fluid. Yeah, the lighter fluid. So yeah. there, there you go. Yep. Check this out. Thirty days of coaching available for free to anybody. Go to mindpumpmedia.com and register there. Also, if you want to ask us a question that we can answer on an episode like this one, the place to ask it is Instagram. The page to ask it on is Mind Pump Media. We also have our own personal pages. My page is Mind Pump Sal. Adam is Mind Pump Adam. Justin is Mind Pump Justin. And finally, yeah. we have a YouTube channel called Mind Pump TV. Check it out. There's a new video every single day. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.